Joining me on the Capitol Report set, we have Senator Roger Chamberlain. He's here to discuss the Republican influence during the 2013 legislative session. Thanks so much for coming in. We appreciate it. Good to be back. So, Thank Senator, you. it has been a while. So, I want to begin with kind of a statement that was made by the Senate Republicans during the session, voting in favor of the bonding bill that included the Capitol Restoration Project. It came out early and voted unanimously and then sent it over to the House. It came back with a few more projects attached to it, which you were in favor of. Right. Why did these projects stand above all others, in your opinion? Well, the, um, you know, we're not necessarily opposed to bonding bills. Uh, they serve a purpose, and the state has a responsibility to maintain uh, state infrastructure and buildings. Um, so we're not opposed to bonding bills. What we're opposed to is a lot of bad stuff in bonding bills that, that should not be in bonding bills. The bonding bill that came forward um, that we passed in the last day of the session was important because it had capital restoration money in it. And um, it's an important public project. We support the project. The Republicans believe in that project. And the bonding that we passed for it was limited, focused on that. And so we believe that was important. It was reasonable. It was the right thing to go. It was, it was right. It was smart government. So. Many members of your caucus have stated, however, throughout session that the Capital Restoration Project in particular didn't necessarily have to be all or nothing, or um, it could be all or nothing. It could be done over time. It could just, you could go with the flow as far as the economic climate mm -hmm. and see how it continued mm -hmm. to strengthen. Mm -hmm. So you said it's good government. Was it, was it really important to your caucus to get this project passed now? Why not wait another year? Well. The, the, the timing on the money, you know, these construction projects start, they had to be funded, and you had to keep the funding going. And there was a, you know, I believe there was a, a, a case to be made that breaking that up, installing that, would have uh, created additional costs and hardship uh, to get the project done and complete, complete the project. So, um, and you know, not to mention the fact that I took a tour of the building uh, with uh, Commissioner Kroc and uh, it's, it's in desperate need of repair. So we want to keep those going. We didn't want to jeopardize the project and we didn't want to have the cost increase. So this year, next year, uh, um, I think it worked out pretty well. Okay, let's move on. Republicans did play a role this year during session and that role was in essence preventing some legislation at least temporarily from becoming law and there were two high profile proposals that I can think of. One was the minimum wage proposal. The other was the anti-bullying bill. Neither one of those passed in 2013. Mm -hmm. So let's begin with the so-called so Safe and Supportive Schools mm -hmm. Act and why is it important, in your opinion, for this not to become legislation? It, uh, bottom line is, uh, well, we don't need it. Uh, most schools, all schools, currently employ and implement some sort of anti-bullying uh, procedure and process. Um, if not, then we had legislation. I had a bill, I think uh, Representative Erdahl had it in the House side and offered an amendment uh, a couple times that would have required schools to adopt the school board policy 514 and 524, which were comprehensive policies. It was short, it said here adopt these, but the policy was comprehensive and would allow the schools the flexibility to do what they needed to do to handle the problem in their districts. The bill that came forward that uh, Senator Dibble had was essentially up to a $40 million unfunded mandate. Uh, secondly, when I've talked to school was, uh, school uh, superintendents, administrators, teachers, they don't want this bill. It, they, their job is to teach. I trust the professionals in the schools to take this on and address it. They are not standing in the classrooms ignoring these serious problems, and they're taking care of them. So it's a $40 million unfunded mandate that uh, has serious constitutional problems and questions still attached to it. And yet critics contend, and not just Senator mm -hmm. Dibble, other yeah. critics contend that Minnesota has one of the weakest anti-bullying policies, mm -hmm. provisions in the nation. Mm -hmm. Is that a valid argument? I, I don't think it is. Uh, um, you know, it's a kind of a, nobody wants to be bullied. We want it to stop, we want safe schools. But I believe our teachers and our administrators, our professionals in the schools are doing what they can to prevent it and stop it. Massachusetts has a similar bill, a little bit different, but it absolutely uh, has ham hamstrung the administrators and the teachers out there. I think this puts a chilling, it's a chilling effect 
on teaching. I think it'll be too cumbersome, too burdensome. It's unnecessary, it's expensive. And I think there's a better approach to this. And I think the, taking 514 and 524 from the school board policy and allowing the schools to fit this into their, into their system the best way they can to s suit, satisfy the needs of the community, to meet those needs, I think that's the best way to go. So it's uh, costly, burdensome, probably unconstitutional in many ways, and uh, we got other alternatives to address the issue. Let's move on to minimum wage. There was a provision in the Senate. It's something that your caucus has been vehemently opposed to. Why do you think it's a bad idea? Well, uh, what they talked about on the floor was that it's a job bill, it's a poverty bill. Most people I talk to in the private sector, they do not pay their employees minimum wage. Few people get minimum wage. The people who get minimum wage are um, uh, service staff, and they're making big tips, and teenagers. So it's not a livable wage. It's not intended to be a livable wage. And if you raise the minimum wage arbitrarily, especially up to $9 like the House wanted, you're going to lay off, they're going to lay off people and reduce hours because you cannot impose those kind of costs without, you know, there's a balance to be struck. You can't put those costs on them without passing them on through higher costs or lower wage, or, you know, lower wages in other cases. The first minimum wage bill had hour restrictions and it was, uh, well, they were essentially telling the business that they couldn't fire or lay people off. But there's a different way to do this. The federal, uh, we were willing to say we'll take the federal standards, federal uh, conformity, you know, 725, 775. We were saying we were willing to do that. Um, I'm sure they'll bring it back next year. But uh, it's, it's not a correct argument to say it's a, you know, lift people up out of poverty. It will not. Right. Well, Senator, let's move mm -hmm. on. My last question for you, the box mm -hmm. law, ban the box law, mm -hmm. as it's called. We'll be talking with Senator Champion in just a mo few moments about his provision. Mm -hmm. And essentially, it does not allow employers, private employers, to ask potential employees whether or not they're convicted felons. It does have some protections for people who work with vulnerable adults, such as those in nursing homes. Does this offer enough protection, in your opinion? Is it a good bill, good law? I think it is. Uh, it was a little controversial to start. I signed on to it with Senator Champion. But uh, in the end, the goal is to, the, the, the best way to reintegrate these offenders into society is to get a job. And most of these people, in Minnesota, secondly, most, most of Minnes the people in Minnesota who are convicted uh, criminals, we have the lowest incarceration, incarceration rate in the nation, if not 49th, where they are the lowest. So most of these people are, these offenders are, you know, they're walking around in the streets, they're parole, they're probation, and we would prefer that they be back in the workforce. So this is common sense, reasonable, uh, approach to doing that. It doesn't prevent employers from checking on uh, backgrounds, obviously. There are exemptions for those uh, um, those jobs that require certain uh, uh, criminal history be done. And um, it gets a foot in the door. So I think they'll have an opportunity. So it's a good, good idea and we've prevented cause for action. This won't be a cause for action against employers. Last question for you. Do you think the Senate GOP was effective in the 2013 session considering you are the minority party? <laughs> the deep minority. We, uh, yes, yes it, we were. I think uh, to the extent we could we were effective. And effective I mean uh, we still have a, we still have the charge of representing our citizens and other citizens in this state and doing good policy. And uh, some of the stuff that was coming through was not good policy. It was bad for Minnesota, bad for Minnesota families. It was gonna harm taxpayers at all levels. And we were able to, to uh, change some things, slow some things down, amend some things, and also um, uh, you know, stop some bad legislation. I think that's important to do. Uh, there are things that we need to do, but um, uh, we had to do it smartly, so. Being in the minority, uh, there is a role to play. We can't just give up, and we have to challenge things. Now, the process works the way it is, supposed to work, and I mean, slow, deliberative, and you have to listen to the other folks. So I think we stopped some bad policies, some good things got done, but I think uh, overall it's, well, my humble opinion is it's not too good for the state. Senator <laughs> Chamberlain, happened? we are out of time, but thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Thank you.